Welcome to another episode of the Preparing for Pregnancy After Loss podcast. This is your host, Natalie Facey, and I'm joining you from my apartment in New York City. So if you hear some noise outside, just know that that's the city saying hello. It may say hello several times <laughs> while we're here together, but know that I am grateful to be able to have you in this space. I'm grateful that we are able to connect with each other in this way and grateful that you're a part of this community, grateful that you are seeking your healing in this way. Uh, today's episode is a little bit different, especially for me. I usually have talking points, you know, notes that I'm referring to as I speak. But today I'm just feeling something wanting to come forth through me. And so I attempted to take notes and then the desire was just to get my equipment and begin speaking. So the topic for today is on ancestral healing, ancestral wounds. And as I well firstly i think that the reason why this topic is coming up for me the way that it is is that i'm in the midst of a training on energy healing and an energy healing based on the african tradition so the ancient egyptian tradition or the kemetic tradition and i'm just learning so much in this program a lot about energy healing, a lot about healing in general, a lot about holistic healing, but also a lot about the ancestors and our connection to the ancestors. And I remember after, you know, being, I think it was probably day two of this course, I was like, all right, the ancestors, (laughs) what, what, what is it that we have with these ancestors? Because growing up, I, you know, there was never much exposure to the connection with the ancestors. There was never any talk of the ancestors. I knew that obviously there were people who passed on before us, like grandparents and great grandparents, but there really was no, there was no process of paying homage to them and there was no process of trying to continue a connection with them. So for you, this might also be a really foreign topic. And I would say that for me, it has been very foreign up until perhaps, you know, late last year. And this year, obviously, because I'm in the midst of this course, But I got to the point where I was like, all right, if we're going to keep talking about ancestors, I'm going to need to really understand what this connection is that we have with our ancestors. And perhaps more importantly, what the responsibility is that we now have, you know, as it relates to our ancestors. And so at the end of the the day, I went on YouTube and typed in, what responsibility do we have to our ancestors? <laughs> and all of the options that were coming up just didn't make any sense. And so one of the things that I've been learning in this course on a much deeper level than I've ever learned before is to tune into our own wisdom and the understanding that we have access to universal wisdom. And as long as we are clear enough, as long as we are open enough, then the answers can actually flow through to us, right? So instead of continuing to search online, I tuned into myself and I asked, what responsibility do we have to our ancestors? And the answer that came to me was, let me make sure that I'm putting it into the right words the answer that came to me is that it's not that our ancestors are giving us work it's not that we have to be the mouthpiece and the hands of our ancestors it's that 
the same desire that is planted within us it is an extension and a continuation of the desire that was planted in our ancestors so we can look at this a couple or a few different ways in terms of ancestral connection it could be within your family so on on a familial level it could be within your race so the race that you belong to the race that you identify with on that level and it could be on a human race level meaning the evolution of humankind right so yes so continuing the work that our ancestors began or we're continuing the work that our family lineage began we're continuing the work that our race began and it isn't continuing this work from the sense that our ancestors are asking us to do work it's that it it is it is already a part of us it is already a seed that has been planted within us and so by allowing this seed to blossom we essentially continue the work of our ancestors we don't have to feel the burden of oh like i have to do this for my ancestors or i have to do this to honor my ancestors again the seed has already been planted within us it is already our desire it is already a part of who we are to actually do that work and the role that our ancestors play is to support us in doing that so just as you could have a niece a nephew or even your own children just as they are a part of your family and you want the best for them and you want to support them and give them advice and connect them to people who will help them to really fulfill their own dreams the ancestors on the other side do the same for us i know that i have never spoken about this before and so if you've been listening to the podcast for a while you might be like wait am i is is this the same podcast what's she talking about um but this is something that is really ripe within me it's really wanting to burst forth from me and so if this does not resonate with you that's okay if you're curious and want to continue listening that is beautiful and if you're like oh yeah this is my jam that is also amazing just allow yourself to guide you to whatever your next steps are whether you want to continue listening or whether you want to skip to another episode that might resonate with you more okay so i'm just letting you know that you have the freedom of choice as i continue speaking another or i guess the, the a part of the reason why i am bringing up the ancestors and ancestral healing is because the way that we often refer to our ancestors it's as though they have left us with a curse like we actually use the term ancestral curse meaning they have left us with some burden that we now need to undo they have left us with something that we as this new generation needs to heal and as i'm sitting here and speaking to you one of the quotes that is in front of me and not intentionally but this is from the the my workbook that goes with the the training course that i'm now doing and somehow this is the page that i ended on and i have not read this quote before now so the words say or the quote goes as i heal myself i heal my children as i heal myself i heal my family as i heal myself i heal my community as i heal myself i heal my world 
I'll repeat, as I heal myself, I heal my children. As I heal myself, I heal my family. As I heal myself, I heal my community. As I heal myself, I heal the world. And just because it's so lovely to do things in threes, I'm going to repeat once more. As I heal myself, I heal my children. As I heal myself, I heal my family. As I heal myself, I heal my community. As I heal myself, I heal the world. Now this is something that I have always spoken about. The fact that we are at the center. We, the women, the life givers, we're at the center. And when we work on our own healing, then everything that we touch heals or relationships heal. How we interact with our children, that heals. Our bodies heal so that we can bring in our children or so that they, they are better supported in bringing in our children. There's so much that's healed when we ourselves are healed. And so this is connected to the ancestral wounds and ancestral healing because there there is a lot that we bring on from our ancestors we do inherit their pain we do inherit their trauma we do inherit the things that they weren't able to heal and clear themselves but what i would encourage you to do is to look at it from the perspective that they did the very best they could they did the best they could with what they had, with what they were taught, with the world that they were up against, with the traumas that they inherited from their own parents and grandparents. They did the best they could so that whatever they left for you, it's what they couldn't heal themselves. Whatever they pass on to you, it's what they couldn't heal themselves. And in so many ways, what they passed on to you was what they thought would be survival for you. If strong work ethic is something that is very dominant in your family lineage, it's because they believe that that's how you survive in the world. If distrust of others is something that's strong in your family lineage, it's because of the world that they were living in that led to distrust. And survival for them meant keeping their guards up. So I'd really invite you to look at the thing that we consider to be an ancestral curse as actually a gift. I know that those things sound, they're absolutely the opposite of each other. So if you're like, well, what did she just say? <laughs> Allow me to, to just dive into this further. In the wake of the murder of George Floyd and all of the activism and everything that we began seeing across the world, in the streets, there was so much hurt and pain that had been activated in my body. And so from observing all that I was holding, I reached out to my therapist, my somatic therapist to book a session. In this therapy session, <laughs> I was about to say what showed up, but who showed up were two ancestors, African ancestors. There was a woman on my right and a man on my left. And I could tell that they were both warriors and a king and a queen. They were strong. They looked fearless. And it's like I cannot even find the words to describe them. They felt like royalty. And they felt just strong and wise and powerful. And as I actually, the, the same place where I'm sitting now, that's where I was sitting while I was doing this session. And what came over me was this realization that I was not alone. That even though I had felt so disconnected from what it meant to 
have knowledge of your ancestors, even though I was just that that was just not something that was familiar to me. They were showing me that I was not alone, that I had this connection. And so that was the first time that that channel was being opened for me in, in that somatic therapy session. In the same session, as we're, we're going on, someone else appeared, a Native American Indian woman. And it's interesting. Well, f- let me just go back to the, the fact that the, you know, this king and queen, the woman showed up on my right and the, the, the man showed up on my left. And what I've learned since then is that the right side of our body represents the feminine and the left side represents the masculine. So it's so interesting that they showed up in the way that they did. And each time that I visualize them, it's the same imagery, you know, the woman on the right and the man on the left. And I can always go back to that image when I want to strengthen myself or build my confidence and feel less alone in the world and feel more fearless in the world. So such a powerful imagery for me. Okay, so this native Indian woman uh, showed up in the same session as, as the session was continuing. And I definitely feel that I'm connected to that culture because years and years ago when I was just being introduced to this form of spirituality, I was in a kundalini yoga class <laughs> with um, my new boyfriend, now my husband. When we were first starting to date, I took him to a kundalini yoga class. And so I was in this class with Jose. And in a, I guess, a vision, as I was in this meditative state, there was an, a native Indian woman in a river Uh, and pulling out these precious stones, like dipping in the river and finding these crystals or or gems or precious stones. And when I shared that with the yoga instructor, he said, actually, we have a store downstairs that sells crystals. You might want to check it out. (laughs) And so that was the very first time that I got a crystal or, you know, any form, any form of precious stone. And now I have so many. Um, yeah, so I'm just going back to that because I've had these visions and images of, you know, Nate, Nate, oh, it's always a woman, a native Indian woman, just sharing these, these things with me, these insights with me. So in this particular time in the session, it's as though she were, it felt like she were in a circle, but there was no one else in the circle. You know, there was no one else in, in the, the, the outer part of the circle, but I was directly in front of her in the inner part of the circle. And she had like a bowl of something in her hand. Um, there was fire. I remember that there was the element of fire and the bowl had some mixture of something. And she was essentially helping me to see something more clearly and what she was saying to me was that the the healing was up to me in my family the healing was up to me and my first reaction was why do i have to bear this cross why is it that i have to be the one to do the healing why is it that i have to be the one to go through the pain and therefore the healing And as I was continuing to process this message that was coming from this woman, I realized that it isn't that I was being burdened with it. It's that I was being gifted with it. Meaning, in your family, you are the healer. You get to do this. Right? Like, you get to do this. This is the gift. And so that's where the insight first came to me that our family, the ones that have come before us, meaning our parents or grandparents or great grandparents, they only pass on the best to us. They only give us what they can't heal. They only give us what they can't clear. 
what they can't resolve. And in some cases, like I mentioned before, they're giving us what they think is the best for us. They're equipping us for what they know that life has been for them. And so as we see these unhealthy patterns that are being passed on, I really encourage you to look at it from a perspective of what was my parent going through? What were my grandparents going through? What was happening in the political or socioeconomical landscape? What was happening in their lives, in their personal lives, in their household? What was their experience that led them to the people that they became and the teachers that they became for us? And I'll share something personal that I've never shared before. Well, let me start by saying I grew up in a household that was very traumatic, a lot of violence, alcoholism, hurt, emotional abuse, so much trauma, which is of course why so much of my work has involved healing trauma. You know, like you're drawn to the thing that you've had to go through yourself. And almost all of this was as a result of my father's behavior. I would describe my father as having demons that he couldn't break free of. He was an alcoholic and I suppose that is how he calmed the demons or whatever he was struggling with. And the reason why I don't want to think of my father as the monster is that it didn't start with him. So it was his upbringing. My father came into the world as a result of his mother being raped. That's how my father entered the world. My, grand, my paternal grandmother was also epileptic. Is that the right word? Right, she suffered from epilepsy. And she was told not to breastfeed him because there was a fear that whatever led to the epilepsy would then be transferred to my father. And so this baby was never nurtured in that way. And imagine the trauma that is held in my grandmother's body after being violated in that way. Imagine the trauma that my father grows up with having never been owned by his biological father because this man essentially violated my grandmother. They were never together they lived, I think, in the same neighborhood. I don't know all of my father's story, and that's work that I still need to do for my own personal healing. But I do know that to pass on the blame to him and leave it there, that would be great injustice because it did not begin with him. And so if I go to my paternal grandfather, this person who I have never had a conversation with, this person who committed this crime against my grandmother, it's even strange to call him my grandfather because we have no relationship at all. But if I go to him, the question that comes to mind is, what could have possibly led you to rape? What could have led you to violate someone's body in that way? And the answer has to involve the fact that he too was going through his own version of pain. And perhaps to experience power was to violate someone in that way. Right? So we could go on and on and on with this cycle of hurt. And who knows where it began? Who knows who was the first offender? 
I think the opportunity here is really to work on our own healing. My father has already made his transition. He's already on the other side. He's already an ancestor. Which means that any healing work that I'm doing now, it's like with him on the ancestral plane. It's through journaling and prayers and meditation. It isn't through having a face-to-face -face conversation with him because he no longer exists in this way. So if I expect that he needs to apologize or, or he needs to... Uh, come clean or whatever I expect of him I know that that is impossible so the work that I can do right now is to focus on my own healing and the reason why that's important I'll go back to the the words that I read before as I heal myself I heal my children as I heal myself I heal my family as I heal myself I heal my community as I heal myself, I heal the world. It means that I do not enter the relationship with my partner with the imbalances that I saw in the relationship with my parents. It means that I do not parent the way that I saw my father parent from that level of imbalance. It means that the more healing that I can do on myself, it's a greater healing that I can bring to my family. And this is a thing that I'm learning about healing and ancestral healing specifically. When we heal, we heal the lineage behind us and in front of us. So me right here in the middle, you in the middle, you get to heal the lineage that came before you. You get to bring them rest and peace and redemption. And you get to heal the lineage that comes after you. You get to show your children a different way of parenting, a different way of responding to difficulty, a different way of showing up in the world. And they get to show that to their children and the next generation and the next right oh this is so important this is hugely important the reason why it is especially important in the fertility and the pregnancy journey is because our unhealed traumas show up again what are ancestors were not able to heal they gift it to us we inherit them so that we can do the work so i'm thinking of my father growing up in whatever tiny community he grew up in and not having access to therapists perhaps not having access to people who understood what he was holding literally in his genes, in his biological makeup, perhaps not understanding his behavior and thinking of him as a problem child, and growing up into a man who still had the wounded child within him. And I am thinking of where I am right now, with access to therapists, with access to so much wisdom about healing, with access to technology, with so much support and openness around these forms of healing. So where we are right now, with all the access and the resources that we have, healing becomes our responsibility because if our parents were demonstrating the unhealthy and you know toxic behaviors that they were let's say that they didn't know better or let's say that they were just up against too much let's say that it was too much for them to handle 
and in our interactions with them it felt like abuse it felt like trauma our experience was trauma now we get to start that healing and when we heal they heal whether or not they're still with us if they're still with us it means that us in our healed bodies with our healed minds and spirit when we interact with them it's a whole different kind of interaction there's a different energy that they get from us we can even heal them even if they're miles apart from us because energy doesn't need to be local energy is everywhere okay so I also want to speak to this topic specifically with respect to the pregnancy journey because uh, when we show up we're showing up with our trauma and I have seen this with several clients that I have worked with as a doula it isn't my clients fault that they're showing up with trauma at this point it's it's like who like who do you even point a finger to you know we're holding traumas for so long it's like it's not a blame situation anymore it's like all right if you know that it's there what do we do about it how do we heal it so when trauma shows up on the pregnancy journey it impacts us negatively in a few different ways and i'll share some examples one is that during pregnancy depending on the trauma response that you've been taught the trauma response that you've practiced the most or whatever situation that you're going through whatever trauma response it throws you in it will show up in pregnancy so for me there was a lot of uh, fight flight in my pregnancy every now and again there was some freeze but there was a lot of fight flight in the sense that I was very busy very active even when my husband would say not in these words but essentially asking me to stay still I could not and that's because the trauma response that was in my biology was fight flight it was overwork and being active and being all over the place and really not being able to sit still and i would say also that my worth had been tied into the work that i do you know like my output in the world and so i remember my high-risk doctor saying you know the the issue in my first pregnancy was my cervix shortening and the same thing was happening again and so I got a circlage done and was asked to go on bed rest not really bed rest but like not to be as active um you know like going to work and there was a lot of resistance within me to do that because it felt as though in a sense I was failing you know if, if I'm not working and if I'm not producing then what is my worth like why why should I be paid to just stay home and not do anything why should I not be working and showing that I can be productive and showing that I am worth having this job being on this team and that is straight up a trauma response and so I think what ended up happening was that I was at work or physically in the office a couple days a week and working from home a few days a week but there was a lot of resistance within me meaning I never made peace with working from home it never felt like oh give your body this allow your body to receive this because you are worthy of it it was like no like I need to fight I need to show that I can still produce right and I also know that the reason why that was coming up is because of how scared I was in that pregnancy. I was scared of losing the pregnancy. I was scared of not having control over the pregnancy. Not having control over the outcome of the pregnancy. And so my way of maintaining control, my way of 
convincing myself that I was still worthy, I was still capable, that I still had it together, was to keep working. And so imagine me being this scared woman and you know, scared that I am losing control, scared that I, I don't have really a say in what the outcome of my pregnancy is because apparently whatever the hell my body wanted to do, it was doing it. Or that that's at least what I thought, right? Imagine me being scared and feeling as though I didn't have control and the, the, the one thing that helped me to feel as though I was in control and in my power and was knowledgeable and was capable and was contributing to something in a positive way that was also being challenged. Or it's like there was a threat that that could be taken away from me. So instead of resting and being at ease and really just like chilling out and enjoying the pregnancy, I was in this state of overwork. So that was my trauma response and I know for a fact that there are some of you who in your pregnancy that is your response that is your response because that's either what you observed from your parents it's what you're carrying in your biology or based on what is happening in your system that's the thing that feels right that's the thing that gives you relief by actually being busy. Now, this busyness, it is creating stress. And I know for sure that I created stress within my system. I know for sure. However, the stress was a release from the emotional stress that I was experiencing. So it's like stress on top of stress. And what we know about stress is that it creates a higher likelihood of having negative outcomes in pregnancy. So the baby can be born preterm, which my baby was born preterm. The baby can be born with low birth weight. It can lead to the demise of the birthing person's immune system, which then opens the body to infections and all sorts of other threats. So, yeah, that's just number one. Th yeah, that was just the first one of how it shows up in pregnancy. And that alone has just so many other legs that we could dive deeper into. That's the first one. And so if you're listening to this right now, and if you're pregnant, and if you're in a state of fight, flight, or freeze, whichever of those trauma responses... So how you would know if you're in either of those responses, if you're in fight or flight, if you're in fight, then um, you are very likely getting into arguments with your partner or your doctor or other members of your family. You might feel super defensive and combative as you know people approach you or say things to you. With fight, I would say that if you are very deep into research because you need to find the answers research is important so let me just like say that research is important but if you are obsessed with research and if you need to have all of the answers and if you need to have a perfect plan then that could be an indication that you are in the fight trauma response and what i want to say as i talk about each of these is that they are trauma responses because you've experienced trauma so this is actually a way for your body to protect itself it's a way for your system to get some relief or some defense from what it, it's currently experiencing so don't feel guilty as i share each of these because your body your system your mind is registering these things as good your body your system these things are being registered as either a relief or the protection from what's going on under the surface. So don't feel guilty as I share each of these, but I do want you to think of what is actually going on under the surface. Okay? So flight. Flight is 
movement running away from or well fight is also movement but flight is running away from a threat instead of standing up to a threat being defensive against a threat combating a threat which fight is flight is running away from it because you don't feel as though you're strong enough to face said threat okay how fight shows up flight sorry <laughs> all the f's how flight shows up is you might avoid people so you know think of it as running away from people so it might be not returning phone calls not responding to messages not attending things that you're invited to such as baby showers and other things that would put you in that state of being triggered or re-traumatized again no guilt no shame no judgment these are ways that you protect yourself or bring relief to yourself okay freeze is a state of immobility so think of freeze as not actually being able to move towards action you might experience a lot of brain fog indecision you might just find yourself in your bedroom under the covers the shades pulled just wanting to stay away from people not wanting to interact with people and really being in this state of not being able to move forward with any goals not having any strong desires to move towards anything because you you're frozen right and this state of being frozen i would say this shows up when you are you are feeling the most threatened or that's probably not the best way to say it okay so each of the the those three trauma responses that i shared before the first one which is fight that shows up when you feel your strongest you feel like you actually have a chance the second one it's like all right this threat is way too big for me i don't think i can overcome it let me get the hell out of here okay so that is the the flight running away the third is when you think i cannot outrun this obviously if you can't outrun it then you you cannot stand up to it as well so i cannot stand up to this i cannot outrun this I'm going to lie here and play dead. I'm going to sit here until it passes. And if it doesn't pass, whatever, I'm just going to stay here. So freeze shows up when you have no more options. And so as I'm sharing each of these, begin to think of if you've had any of these experiences, if you're currently experiencing any of them, and if you're pregnant, how they're showing up, right? If you're pregnant and you feel as though you have to be combative with your doctor or medical team, or if you're deep within research without the ability to enjoy your pregnancy and really experience the joy of your pregnancy, then that might be fight. Going to the, the other end, freeze, it's wanting to just sit at home until the end of the pregnancy and i'm remembering in my second pregnancy as i was experiencing all of these triggers and and these fears and feeling like i didn't have control over the outcome i was power walking to work because <laughs> when 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 you live in a body where you know your trauma response is to be very active to be on like i don't know whatever just to be very active then you move fast you move quickly so i was poor walking from the subway to work and i remember thinking if someone could just give me an injection and wake me up when we get to the end of this pregnancy then my life would be so much easier like can't someone just wake me up just let me know when it's time to push this baby and I will give birth to this baby. Because if that were to happen, I wouldn't be living every single moment in fear, in worry, feeling breathless, having my heart pace just like off the charts. Like that was a legit wish. Like can someone just 
put me to bed and wake me up when it's time to give birth to this baby. That was my desire for freeze. That was my desire to opt out of the normal length of the pregnancy and just wake up when it's over or when it's about to be over. So if that thought has crossed your mind, then you are likely experiencing a trauma response. Going back to our ancestors, we experience our own traumas within our life, right? And so a pregnancy loss, that is a traumatic event that I experienced. For you, it might also be a pregnancy loss or infant loss or infertility. In addition to our own traumas, we also inherit or are gifted with the traumas from our ancestors. Also, the traumas from our ancestors can contribute to the imbalances in our own bodies, can contribute to the things that show up in our pregnancies or health conditions or fertility this is a very real thing if you have heard or come across the work of i think her name is dr de Groy, right her name is dr joy de Groy. i hope i'm pronouncing that correctly but it is j-o-y first name d-e-g-r-u-y last name and she talks about what we carry in our bodies as a result of being descendants of slaves. And this is a friend of mine who shared this work with me and it made so much sense to me because a lot of the work that I had been doing was on trauma and how trauma is held in the body. So I had already been doing my training in, in somatic therapy or somatic healing and so this was another piece of the puzzle that I had not been exposed to before, right? I was looking at trauma from this broader perspective, but not looking at it specifically from the perspective of the descendants of slaves, which I am one. And one of the things that I came across, or one of the things that this friend shared with me was that in the Caribbean, and I think when Dr. De Groy shared this example, she mentioned Jamaica specifically. In the Caribbean, because of how the slaves were being mistreated, because of how hard they had to work, the women actually became infertile. The women were no longer producing offspring because the reproductive functions of their bodies just shut down. And so there were all these slaves that were being brought to the Caribbean to essentially uh, replenish the stock. That sounds like a curse word as it came out of my mouth, but I guess we have to be real about our history. So there are all these slaves that were being brought to the Caribbean because the, the women slaves were not producing. And in the midst of me coming upon this research, Another friend of mine who was experiencing uh, infertility shared that at one point, you know, over the course of several months, as she was experiencing a lot of stress, both from work and personally, she actually stopped seeing her period. She stopped menstruating because her reproductive function essentially began shutting down. Right? So... I want us to look at what what's happening in our bodies from the perspective of what might I be carrying from my ancestors that hasn't been healed, but also what's happening in my day-to-day -day life right now. Just being on the fertility journey alone is extremely stressful. Going through you know, the treatments and putting different medications in your body. And, you know, I, I don't want to say physical harm, but by injecting your body, there is pain and discomfort and swelling and soreness. 
there is the physical stuff that your body is experiencing, right? And with that, I almost think of them as being mini traumas, these mini traumatic experiences, so that if the healing and the clearing isn't being done at the same time, when your body is going through those difficult experiences, then you store them in your body, in your biology as trauma. And how does that then continue to impact your ability to conceive? How does it impact the outcome of your pregnancy? Okay. So I think the solution is to, or a part of the solution from my perspective, obviously, but based on what is coming up for me, a part of the solution is to release the idea that you have been given this burden from your ancestors and be open to the idea instead that they did the best they could begin to be more accepting of what the situation is right now because when you release the energy of resentment from your body then there's greater healing that you have access to I can tell you so many stories of just so much harm that my father brought to my mother and or family, myself, my siblings, so many stories. But if I hold on to that resentment, that continues to affect my body. And he's dead right now, like he's not here. <laughs> He's not here in this physical realm. He's not here walking this earth as a, as a breathing human. He exists in the spirit realm. And so if I hold this against him, and I, I hold unforgiveness against him, then what does that do to my body? What does it do to my liver and my stomach and my kidneys? my heart all of these organs if you look into traditional Chinese medicine all of these organs hold a certain emotion they are brought out of balance based on what we haven't been able to release and so imagine me holding so much hurt and so much resentment towards my father, so much anger. And it's showing up in my own body today. And then depending on what I'm able to clear and not clear, it shows up in my children's bodies. It might show up in patterns or fears that my son has. Or patterns or fears that my daughter has or whatever they identify as. And so the reason why I encourage you to look at this as a gift, because when you don't look at this as a curse, then you embrace this as almost like the, the privilege of having, of being able to do this healing work. the privilege of being able to do this healing work like you get to heal the generation i know that that might have sounded really heavy <laughs> like what a responsibility to heal a generation right but you get to ensure that history doesn't repeat itself you get to ensure that the imbalances that your grandma experienced and your, your mother experienced and that you might currently be experiencing, that it doesn't repeat itself in the generation of 
your daughters and your sons in the generation of your children because guess what? You deal with it right now. Now, isn't that a gift? Isn't that a privilege to be able to heal in that way? For you to not only heal, but to heal your ancestors and to heal your children. Oh my gosh, this is massive. <sighs> yeah, I encourage you just to sit with that. I encourage you just to see what resonates with you. So if, like me, you are very new to the ancestors, if you now have a level of curiosity but you're not sure where to start there is this teacher that my uh, energy healing teacher introduced to me his name is Malidoma Same so first name M-A-L-I-D-O-M-A -A. last name is S-O-M-E accent on the E and he is a West African elder and an amazing speaker and teacher. Check out one of his YouTube videos because he talks a lot about the ancestors, our connection to the ancestors, and the wisdom passed on from our ancestors. So that I did not mention, but legit, so much wisdom passed on from our ancestors. And so, yeah, like our ancestors want the best for us, you know, they, they want to, to be able to support us in healing what they couldn't heal. They want to support us in carrying out our own personal work and our own uh, vision in the world. And so we are bestowed with these gifts from them. Like I'm pretty sure that the reason why I am comfortable speaking without a script comfortable standing up in front of an audience and presenting is because of my father. I am pretty sure. My father was a singer, also the reason why I sing in the shower. <laughs> um, my father, I, could, I would also say, uh, was always a teacher. Like There were always these younger men from the neighborhood that would be around him looking to learn different principles from him. Uh, he was also into the Rastafarian um, principles, Rastafarian teachings. And so he would teach them what he knew from different books, different spiritual books. And it's probably why I have always been open to different forms of spirituality and different forms of connecting to the divine. I grew up going to a Pentecostal church in Jamaica, but even while going to that church and hearing, you know, their teachings from the Bible, I was also getting the teachings interpreted from a different way from my father. And I was also being exposed to the Rastafarian philosophy, which I think helped me to be very open-minded and it helped to support me in exploring spirituality and exploring what it looks like for me to connect with God and to connect with the divine and so I definitely can already you know name some gifts that I have received from my father and from my mother a ton of gifts like my mom is one of the strongest humans that I know she's a Leo a lion she is fierce and I just grew up knowing how strong women are because of being raised by my mother. And so, so many gifts that we receive from our ancestors. And I still need to learn more about the other people in my lineage, such as my grandparents, my great grandparents. But I know for sure that, you know, while we talk about being born with the, the trauma, from our ancestors or in other words you know these these gifts that that haven't been healed these gifts that they pass on to us so that we we take on the baton of healing while we inherit those things we also inherit their strength we also inherit their wisdom 
there are so many dreams that I've had, so many times that I have had guidance to do something, and I followed that guidance, and then I found out from reading something scientific that it actually made sense. <laughs> so trust that you are guided. And also trust, yes, also trust that the fact that you are listening to this right now, it might mean that there is something here for you. The fact that you're listening to this right now, it might be the answer to something that you have been asking for. And so even though this idea of connecting with the ancestors can be frightening because of how, you know, how the ancestors are often presented to us, you know, for, for one, we're afraid of death. And so to think of being in connection with anyone who is who isn't living in the way that we are right now that alone just sounds very strange and you know if you have a certain religious belief that might also cause resistance within you to even explore this um, a thought or memory that's come into me is a client that I worked with for doula support and I wasn't her primary doula I was the backup and I was being introduced to this client so I was on the phone with this client and I asked are you do you feel a connection with any of your ancestors and I could see this expression on her face like what no and her response was I, I believe in Jesus Christ or or something to that nature and i was like oh yeah she's like me when i first <laughs> when i first heard people talking about the ancestors like she's having the response that i first have and so what i shared after was that you know sometimes when a grandparent or you know someone in our family passes on and we have a connection with them when we love them or when they loved us dearly, then we might feel this sense of comfort and protection if we imagine them in the room with us as we're giving birth. And immediately I saw this smile just spread over her face because she got what I was trying to say. Like I wasn't trying to tell her to be beating any drums and to be calling in any spirits. <laughs> Not that there's something wrong with that, but that isn't what I was saying. I was asking her to bring in something that reminds her or someone that reminds her that she's loved. Someone that reminds her that she's protected and that she's not alone. Right? And I, I, I sometimes bring this up to other clients based on um, you know, a prior conversation that we might have and if I think they might be open to this. So I'm saying that to say, you don't have to go crazy, you know, digging up African history or, you know, trying to figure out what the ancestors are and how to connect with them. For now, just start with the ones that you know, the ones that loved you. Try to learn more about them and try to see is there something from their experience that i can bring into mine i'm remembering another client and i was back up for this client as well and when i asked her this question i think i framed it around if there was anyone in her family that reminded her of strength or something around that i don't know if i had mentioned ancestors but it was something around being strong or anyone who inspired her. And she mentioned her grandmother and how her grandma had been living in the South and she was the first one in her family to come up to the North. Like the grandma was really like a pioneer and the grandma became educated and became a doctor, I think either a psychologist or, or something in the mental health field. And I was like, yeah, amazing. So as this woman was giving birth, she could remember that she had the strength of her grandmother 
and those are the words that I offered to her. I repeated the name of her grandmother and I said, you are this person's granddaughter. And so the strength that she has and the courage that she has, you have that within your blood and within your bones. It is a part of the makeup that you are. And so depending on your race, depending on your background, think of the strength that lives in your body and in your blood. And I would say for me, being the descendant of a slave, well, not a slave, of several slaves, then yes, I have strength in my blood and my bones. And this king and queen that appeared by my side, this African king and, king and queen that, you know, on some level I could say that I don't know them, but I know that they are my ancestors. I am a part of their lineage. And so I have their strength, I have their wisdom, I have their courage, I have their fearlessness. And so I'd encourage you to start to walk with that sense of nobility, to walk with that sense of pride, knowing who you descended from, knowing who is in your lineage, and this is the part that's really freaking cool. Like you get to do that for your children and your grandchildren. Like you get to be the ancestor that they look back at and say, Oh, grandma, this did so and so. Grandma, this overcame this thing. Ooh, huh. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that is just amazing. That is just amazing. But before I turn you into ancestors, <laughs> let's just start by having you do your healing work. Let's just start by having you release from your body the things that you are holding that was meant to be the thing that you get to heal. You don't have to hold it anymore. There are too many resources there is too much freedom. There is too much access for you to still be holding on to stuff. And I know that there might be this level of distrust, right? Within, within your body, there might be this level of distrust as you're working with therapists or doctors or whoever. Like that, that in itself is a sign of a trauma response. But I don't want your distrust, I don't want your fear to stop you from healing. So whatever you need to do to get to the other side, to get to your healing, start doing that thing. If you need to go into to, to the fight mode a little bit and research a bunch of doctors and get a second opinion, then do that. If that's the thing that you need for your healing, go for it. You, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know how much I praise somatic healing or somatic therapy because it is work that heals trauma. Talk therapy is incredible work and talk therapy has helped so many people to come to a greater level of understanding of the, the types of trauma they've been experiencing and I do not want to discredit talk therapy, but I do want to say that it has limitations when it comes to healing trauma that you're holding in the body. Because you talk about it. You talk about it, but you're, you don't release the energy of it to the extent that you do in a somatic healing session somatic healing is specific for trauma because trauma lives in the body it isn't something that you talk out and resolve it's something that you move through your body in different ways and so i highly recommend that you look into somatic therapy or somatic healing there are sessions that are done virtually there are sessions that are done in person. 
If you prefer seeing someone in person, then look to see who offers it in your area. I offer somatic therapy virtually and it has been really, really effective. You don't actually need to touch a person's body. You guide them into being aware of the energy that they're holding. And so the way that touch came in, and touch was always gentle touch, gentle touch on the shoulder or you know at the feet or the legs, it was always gentle touch. But the touch was really done to invite someone to become aware of what's happening in their body because we're so often just trapped in the mind, trapped in a loop in the mind. And by offering this gentle touch, it's like the body can come alive, the body can awaken, and then you're able to notice what the body is holding. But you're also able to do that virtually by simply guiding someone to that awareness of what's happening in their body, to the awareness of what they're holding. And so I highly, highly recommend that you explore that modality. Um, if you're interested in learning more, send me an email. I'm at hello at nataliefacey.com. Reach out to me on Instagram or if you're in the Facebook community, you, can, you know that you can DM me. And as I am sharing this, become aware of what's coming up for you. Like what are the fears that are coming to mind for you? You know, is there a fear that, oh, this, this thing sounds so strange this thing sounds different. What if it doesn't work? So become aware of those fears and give yourself the permission to support yourself in your own healing. If what you've been trying so far has not been working, give yourself the permission to explore something different. You can also check out my website, nataliefacey.com forward slash testimonials to see the experience of people that I've worked with and you know the, the difference they notice in their body from from practicing somatic therapy um, and of course there are other practices and modalities that you can do at home such as movement you know like yoga dancing anything that brings you within your body is going to lead to greater healing if you are really busy in your system like super fight or flight and not really able to settle and experience stillness then practices around stillness and meditation are actually going to be healing and balancing but i would say it you know this healing journey is not one that you should walk alone and the reason for that is some days you will feel energized and motivated and you're like all right let me get this healing thing together right? I'm going to do X and Y and Z. And within another three months, I'm going to be good. And what happens when you are the one who is having to hold space for you, the one who is having to guide yourself, is that eventually you might lose steam. Eventually, you might become discouraged eventually you might come upon some experience whether it's a trigger or a memory like something that gets you off track and so it's really beneficial to work with someone as you're on this healing journey so it could be that you have an accountability partner so you know a girlfriend or someone not 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 your your romantic partner that you live with like not your husband not your boyfriend or girlfriend or wife not the person that you're living with but someone outside of your home that you can call and talk to and they understand you they are willing to create space for you non-judgment space and just really allow you to feel safe in expressing yourself um, you can also work with a therapist, but as I mentioned, if it's a talk therapist, there are definitely limitations there. You can work with me. I offer a coaching program for those who are planning to conceive or are currently pregnant after loss or infertility. And I also offer a somatic healing program for those who really just want to focus on their healing. So you're not necessarily 
actively trying to conceive and you might not even feel ready to conceive, but you know that you're holding a lot of emotional pain that you want to work through and resolve and clear, right? So those are some options for your healing. And yeah, definitely, you know, if, if you've come across other modalities that resonate with you, definitely explore them. They're, I would say there's hardly any harm in exploring something if you're curious because it might lead you to your healing. Before somatic therapy, there were so many other practices that I explored so that by the time I got here, everything made sense. It was like, oh yeah, of course. Of course it makes sense that we're holding stuff in our body because I was already trained as a coach. And within that training, um, a part of what I learned was that you know, certain emotions are held in certain parts of the body. So by the time I got to somatic healing, it really was a no-brainer. Like, of course. Now, here's a way to heal that's different from coaching or that can be a complement to coaching. So definitely encourage you to move towards whatever feels as though it's been calling you. If you listen to the first episode from, you know, the start of this year, the one just before this one, I mentioned that, or I might have, it might have been a live that I did on Instagram, but I was mentioning that on our planet right now, things are happening at such a rapid pace because we're being called to heal at a, a more rapid pace. It's like there is more urgency for a healing because of the evolution that humanity is going through. So be a part of that, be a part of that evolution. It means that if you're not, you're going to start experiencing a lot of discomfort. That is the discomfort that we experience from being stuck, from not evolving, from not being able to move with what's happening because we're still having to wrestle or hold on to the, the hurt and the harm that we've experienced before. And I, I know how difficult that that hurt and that harm is because I've gone through my own version of that. So don't think that I am criticizing you for not doing your work. I'm simply putting a highlight on the fact that it has become even more important for us to do that work. Okay, so yeah, this feels like a good place to land for today. I hope that some of this resonates with you. It might not resonate with you immediately, but you might, you know, some insight might come to you in another couple of days from now, or from you being exposed to this, if it's the first time that you've been exposed to ancestral healing and this kind of work, then you might start seeing it in other places, on Instagram, on YouTube, in the posts that your friends share. You might start seeing it more because you were exposed to it today. And if this was already a part of your language and if this was already a part of how you operate, then hopefully this gives you affirmation that you know, you're on the track that you need to be on or it gives you some more resources to further your healing. Okay, so thank you for staying with me until the end. I've shared before, but I'm so grateful that I get to be with you in this way. I'm so grateful that we get to be on this journey in this way. I'm so grateful that what I am learning, I get to share it with you with the hopes that it can benefit your own journey. And feel free to share with me what you're learning, whether it is, you know, by sending me an email or inside of the, the, the Facebook community, feel free to share with me as well, or even request topics that you want me to explore or dive into, into future podcasts. But I hope you know how grateful I am that you are here, that you're listening and that you share these with others so that others can be on their healing journey as well. I really hope you know that. 
So I am sending you a lot of love. And I've been really intentional so that as I write that in text messages or in like a WhatsApp message, I actually pause and send someone the energy of love. So I am holding my hand to my heart chakra, to my chest. And I am imagining that this lovely pink energy that is expanding in my chest, that it is flowing to you and that whatever amount of it that you would like to receive, that you receive it. And as I send this energy of love to you, I imagine that you are also sending an energy of love, that you're also sending an energy of appreciation. And somehow the color that's coming to mind is green. So it feels as though it's coming back from you as being green. And so thank you for your presence. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. And thank you for the work that you get to do in the world. Thank you for the work that you get to do in the world, for the baton that you get to run with. <laughs> for the fires that you start or for the ones that you put out. Whatever your work is, thank you for it. Thank you for showing up and thank you for doing your healing. Okay. So you know where to find me. I am on Instagram as the birth warriors, one word email me at hello at nataliefacey.com i am also inside of our private facebook community come on over if you're not already a member i lead a birth warrior wednesday every wednesday at 6 p.m eastern standard time where i share topics on healing from loss and preparing for your next pregnancy so come on over find me inside of the facebook community it's called the birth warrior community on facebook and you'll find the links to all of these within the show notes. So again, thank you for, for being here and thank you for all the ways that you have been showing up and that you will continue to show up for your healing, the healing of your children born or unborn, the healing of your relationship, the healing of your family and the healing of our world. Thank you.